All right. And Adam Bunch joins me from Toronto. Kyle Kuko from Uxbridge. Welcome to the show, guys. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having us, yes, uh, fans of the podcast. So it's well, fun to, to be on one we actually listen to. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that uh, and looking forward to, as I said before, uh, w in the intro, Canadiana debuts next week, season three, June 28th, with the first of a two part uh, episode. And I said to you guys, th this is a show that I've watched before. It's, uh, as we say, going into its third season. But before we get into some of the specifics of this season, can we just talk a little bit about the rather unique circumstances of producing this show? Because this isn't something that, like the podcast, I can do this from my house. You know, we've done shows in person with people face to face before, but when the pandemic came, I could keep going in this type of a format. This show is not one that is done in a studio in in isolation. So maybe Adam, if we start with you, what unique challenges did the pandemic bring and how much of a delay did it really cause in this season? Yeah, we got our funding lockdown just in time, just as COVID <laughs> was starting. And we started making plans for, oh, by next summer, uh, we, we should be able to travel across the country and uh, mingle with people, no problem. And then that's not what happened at all. So down really even to the final weeks, we were paying a lot of attention to uh, what was safe and not safe and we're lucky that we were filming uh, just at the end of last summer when things briefly quieted down for a while and that uh, a lot of the provinces we were going to had strict uh, measures in place as well driving over the confederation bridge to get our test at the border on the way into <laughs> pei and uh, moments like that uh, so we, yeah, we had to wait and make sure everything was fine and then try to do it all as fast as possible too, which was uh, pretty exhausting sort of being yeah. away from home almost every day for a right. few months uh, racing around the country. Uh, and, and yeah, stuff too, like archives and libraries yeah. not being open so that even doing the research heading into the filming uh, was more of a challenge than it usually is. Mm -hmm. And, and Kyle, from your end, Sue, you were, you were talking about the, the challenges presented. You're in Uxbridge, as I said, the big storm that we had really across Ontario affected you with no power impacting the editing time that you had. So that's just another factor on top of what was already a, a really challenging and, and, as Adam said, a pretty rushed season for you. Yeah, uh, the editing process on uh, Canadiana is intensive and lengthy and every day counts and every hour counts. So when a tornado came out of nowhere and kind of ran through our town, it was, uh, you know, it was terrifying and also horrific for the town, but uh, also it severely impacted my ability to edit anything or continue animating for the season. So it just seemed like another you know, there's been a bunch of things, you know, uh, renovations in locations like Parliament being under construction, Province House mm -hmm. being under construction. These sort of things happen every season. Uh, so it just seemed like another one of those kind of unavoidable things that pop up. Oh, well, I mean, a tornado, but yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. And, and certainly, you know, I, as I'm based in Ottawa, the giant hole in front of parliaments, uh, that's, it's literally what it is right now, a giant hole in front of Parliament Hill doesn't make, I would imagine, for the most picturesque viewing. They've tried with the walls as best they could to hide it. But, I mean, I'm not a filmmaker, but I would imagine that presents some, some unique challenges. Uh, but Adam, I want to talk about the archives. You mentioned this, Library and Archives Canada, Last week, I believe, announced that the system of booking appointments for, I believe, four-hour blocks for research, that is ending. They are going to be open business as normal now. That is, of course, the biggest archive in the country. Smaller archives, provincial archives have had similar limitations. So I am very interested in the research part of this because this is a research-intensive show. And you can tell from watching it. You can also just look at the credits at the end of the show just to see how much uh, research is done. So how much was the limited archive availability a challenge to you? And how did you and the team work to overcome that? Yeah, I mean, there's some things we just couldn't really get our hands on, some primary sources uh, that are kept in archives that just weren't open at all. Uh, 
uh, we're lucky that it's 2022 or 2021 when we're doing the research. So uh, a lot of amazing stuff's already online. Uh, and the Toronto Public Library, which is filled with books, a treasure trove of information for a lot of our research was uh, closed, but you could uh, come by and pick up books. So it was a lot of, uh, yeah, sort of planning ahead and trying to find ways to get information through other routes if we couldn't get our hands on the actual thing. A lot of, uh, yeah, just more ordering library books, more reading sort of secondary sources to try to get what we could of uh, primary sources that had been repeated and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, a little more challenging, a little more time consuming, uh, but thankfully, yeah, the, the online resources that are available across the country are such a huge help with every season and then especially with this one. Yeah, I, I, you probably couldn't have done this 10 years ago, right? Like if this was 20, 20 or 2011 pandemic, like the, the, the speed at which this has all happened for online resources, things being made available, it, it really is remarkable to me, given how slow so many other things in public settings can be. Yeah, and even really every step of the way. So for research and even coming up with the ideas originally and finding interesting stories to tell, uh, all the way through to the end and the editing uh, process and animations uh, were a tiny team of mostly three core members. And then we hire some extra help when we can afford it. Uh, but all that kind of editing and animation wouldn't have been possible that long ago either. Plus the fact that we're available free to watch on YouTube and able to post it without having a broadcaster uh, to put it on television. All that stuff is so recent and we're yeah very lucky and uh, have lucked out in our time. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a primary, as a web series, it really does add a lot to it and the, the free side of it. And, and I'm curious, Kyle, from your perspective, when we're talking about availability of, of things and particularly with terms of editing, I've always been struck by the number of number of archival images that are put into the show in a variety of forms, right? Like there's sometimes it's on the screen with, uh, with Adam there, with animations going on, sometimes it's still photography, whatever it is. But how was the lockdown and the challenge to get those resources? How does that play out in the show? Like when someone comes to it this season, is there a noticeable difference in what they're going to see on the screen based purely on, on what was available to you? Um, well, it's, it's funny because it's a, it kind of is a fluctuating situation from episode to episode. You know, some episodes, there's a lot of available archival material to work with, um, while others like, say, our first episode here about pirates, there's, you know, there's just some drawings from the 1600s or so, or 1700s. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I basically create my own archival in a way where, you know, I find old paintings of that are public domain and I, and I merge them together with, you know, outfits and I make pirates from them. So it's, there are situations like that. And then there are situations where there's archival footage, which is amazing. And, you know, Library Archives Canada has some amazing stuff out there uh, as well as the, you know, the American archives for stories that kind of dabble in American, uh, you know, with American characters and figures. So, you know, the pandemic didn't totally affect that side of things because, you know, the editing didn't start till, you know, after the kind of the last wave, but um, it's, uh, it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to sum it up all in one thing, but, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a wild process. Every episode is completely different, that's right. all I can say. Yeah, and, and that would be a product of each topic being very different. And I'm curious, how do you guys decide what you want, like in terms of the stories? This season coming up is very diverse in its storytelling. You mentioned piracy. You got some Gazenko in there, uh, which takes me back to my undergraduate days, the, the Gazenko affair, uh, witches, horses, civil war. Like there's a lot in here uh, that is very diverse. So how do you go about picking the topics, given the fact that the number one refrain I get from whenever I talk with high school groups, even undergraduate students, 
about why they aren't interested in Canadian history, it's because it's boring. That is the, the number one refrain, which I think anyone listening to this, and certainly the three of us, probably don't agree with that, but that is the reputation of Canadian history. So how do you go about trying to find those interesting stories and selecting them, knowing that you're going to be able to get a full around 20 minute episode out of the topic? Yeah, the, <clears throat> there is just such a rich list to pick from. Uh, so the first thing we're always doing is just looking for what interests us the most. And when we're doing research for other episodes, we've always got our eyes and ears open for anything that might make a good episode one day. So we've got a running list at all times. I think it's now up to uh, well over 100 possible ideas for future episodes and all of them really exciting, fascinating, engaging material. Uh, and we're also always looking for stories, uh, sort of unique, sort of individual personal stories that can let us tell a bigger story about big historical forces uh, that are at work. So those are the ones uh, we're going to be most attracted to usually. Uh, and then when it comes time to plan out sort of a new filming season and uh, our trips across the country, it's balancing those stories as much as possible so that we do have as much diversity in the stories as possible. In terms of uh, the people who are represented in those stories and the geography of the country and making sure we're telling stories from every corner we can possibly reach uh, on uh, the budget, the way of working for us, and you know, just sort of trying to make it that uh, that differing in as much variety as possible while also being the most engaging stories and uh, the most important stories that, that we've got on that list. Right. It's almost like a puzzle rather than a hierarchy of stories. Like there might be a story on that list that maybe it's a better story in your heads than something that you're doing, but like it's a puzzle because you want to get everything in. And it's not that what's in this season is bad or what's what you've done before is bad necessarily, but you, you just got to think of it not necessarily as like, all right, like ranking, but how does it all fit together as a more of a mosaic? Yeah, so previous seasons, we'd already been to uh, some places. Uh, we did our first season, especially when we were just paying out of pocket and funding it ourselves. We just drove to Montreal and Quebec and Ottawa and did a bit of Toronto and uh, just covered what we could physically reach within a few hours drive. Uh, so this season, especially where we had a bit more funding than previous seasons, we wanted to make sure we were going to places we hadn't covered before, which is why this first big two part episode we're launching next week is all about the history of piracy on the East Coast. And we've got upcoming episodes about uh, the Newfoundland dog and uh, hopefully Vikings and lots of East Coast stuff. We also <laughs> hit Saskatchewan and the prairies for the first time because we hadn't been able to do that before. Uh, and yeah, try to fill in those holes as much as possible with, yeah, as I say, the most engaging stories uh, that we've got on the list for those places in particular. Yeah. And uh, Kyle, for you, in terms of the visual side of it, if you look at just the trailer for this year, which is already available, uh, and and I'll put it in the show notes, the link to that in the show notes, it's visually large at times, right? Certainly, you know, it seems like there's some drone shots that you used uh, and, and did that. So how much does, when you're picking a story, the potential visual element play into it when you're talking about like, going to Newfoundland or going north? With it? Like those are places that have some pretty spectacular scenery that you can use. Does, does that factor into the decision-making process at all? Uh, it definitely does. Uh, episodes that have locations like kind of front front and center that we can, you know, kind of lay out in our minds as the skeleton of the episode, they tend to be more attractive to view for a number of reasons. You know, one of our big things is that, you know, when we started this series, we wanted to see Canada, we wanted to see the places represented on screen because we, we, it's so often that we don't really see that. You don't get to see small towns representing themselves with their own stories on screen. So it was always supposed to be a mix of animation and location footage. So, um, so that's a big thing. Um, and it, you know, it also is like if the episode is entirely animation and archival, it, uh, it's, it's quite a lot of work and it's quite a lot more time and people want to see, you know, they want to see the locations, you know, and they're so, they're so incredible and, and they, you know, 
Canadian history um, is cinematic. You, you can find the cinematic aspects of their of the stories and and the, you know the land and the the towns and the buildings. They all they all uh, feed into it so easily. So so yeah, a lot of episodes. But there are so many. We have so many ideas. It's it's kind of just a treasure trove to be honest. So yeah. Yeah, well, certainly, yeah, there's there's a lot there. I watched over the weekend, uh, went back and watched the Thomas Darcy McGee uh, episode. And even that one, it's not grand visually, but, you know, you go to the jail, uh, you, you're walking around Spark Street. Like, the, the, there is that visual on-location part of it. How much for you guys is that key, that you are at the location? Because a story like Thomas Darcy McGee, in theory, you could do that standing in front of a green screen anywhere and just put images behind it but but why is it so important on even a story like that that might not be the grand visual storytelling as some other stories why why is it so important to do it on location i think it has been a core part of what we wanted to do since the very beginning at least in part well in part because it is cinematic and some of these places are spectacular so it just makes for a better viewing experience when you can see uh, these parts of the country, some of which, you know, since it's a, a pretty big place, Canada, uh, people don't get to see themselves. Uh, so, you know, we get to go to somewhere like Labrador, or the Yukon, and show people what that looks like uh, if they're not able to go there themselves. But also that I think it helps drive home the fact that these stories are around us all the time. And they're tied to these physical locations that, in a lot of cases, are part of our everyday lives. So we try to make that uh, balance, too, of telling stories that are in cities and in towns and also out, outside them uh, and show people that uh, these stories happened in these places, in our cities and in our provinces and in these real places, uh, which does make it absurdly hard to do since we're always working with uh, not enough budget and not enough people. Uh, and uh, the idea of flying to the Yukon and the Labrador within a few weeks of each other to shoot uh, a YouTube series is, uh, yeah, makes it a little too ambitious at, at times, <laughs> certainly for our bodies and our sleep schedules. Uh, but it is really important to us to be able to show the country and show the places where these stories actually happened and drive home the point that these stories are yeah, embedded in these places and are around us all the time yeah, yeah I, I think that's really well said yeah uh, no sorry please go go ahead kyle well i was just going to say it's but yeah we, we're trying to get across this the feeling that we feel when we are you know walking along spark street um you know because it's a character it's a character and we're trying to show that you know, show the character off um, anyway sorry that was my <laughs> no no that's that it's a really good point because I think especially when you live somewhere, right? I live in Ottawa. I've walked down Spark Street thousands of times. I don't really think about it twice when I'm walking down Spark Street. But when I go to, say, Moose Jaw, right? I've been lucky enough to go to Moose Jaw. And I walk down in it through Main Street and Moose Jaw and you see the, the images on the walls or you go down to the tunnels. That's a remarkable experience for me. So what you guys are doing with the show, you're allowing me, as you say, to take me somewhere that I've never been before. And, and if the, in this season, Labrador, up north, whatever it is, that that is a really cool thing that you're doing. And yeah, even if a story doesn't necessarily have the wide vistas and the big drone shots, it does bring the history to somebody and it does feel like a, a closer connection. And so I, I certainly agree with that assessment, but it does cost a lot of money. As you say, this is a big country. It's expensive to get around. You said you basically bootstrapped that first season, which is very impressive to me, but I, I, I'm always amazed that when, when people can generate some uh, funding, some income from these types of history projects. Now, I, I don't want to go too inside on it, but how challenging has it been for you guys to to get that funding and create a product that when i watch it like it's slick it's it's clean it, it doesn't look like an amateur type of a show right and i'm very familiar with creating amateur type shows so you know you guys have, have done something very professional uh and and you're you're saying that it's been a struggle to get funding but 
it doesn't look like it. Well, we appreciate that. That is very kind. But uh, yeah, it's it's hard because um, I don't know. When we first started, there it, it didn't seem like there was anyone else like us out there, even on YouTube, besides maybe Historica Canada. So uh, when we tried to get funding, it wasn't. Um, we were turned down, and there was you know there was still kind of this idea of Canadian history is boring, you know we were kind of the underdogs uh but then we were thankfully we got the bell fund to support us in, in the second season and it just opened so many doors we were able to like you know go to the yukon and um and you know it, it that helps immensely of course because we could never afford to fly out to these places it's it's uh wild um and we just try to, you know, in terms of the quality of the show, it's it's been a learning process from day one. So it's a lot of our own sort of spending countless hours, you know, you know, working on our animation and, you know, working on camera work and trying to trying to get good audio <laughs> on location everywhere. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, um, I don't know, maybe Adam, you, you can take it from here. Yes, uh, it was that first season was all mostly just uh yeah putting in the hours and trying to show what we thought we could do and a lot of learning as we went uh and hopefully we've gotten uh considerably better at it over the last few years although i think we're still very proud of how the first season looks too and once we'd proved the concept and that it could work and that there was an audience uh for these stories uh especially then uh, we were able to start getting funding and grants, and uh, like this season we're supported by Parks Canada and Bell Fund and Canadian Media Fund and History Fund and uh, sort of pool these resources together and uh, still sort of, uh, in some ways, self, uh, to our own, yeah, self-destructively dedicate uh, <laughs> as many hours as we possibly can to it uh, to just try to make it better than even the budget uh, really allows it to be without, uh, yeah, putting in that work. Uh, and, and like I say, I, mean, I, I really do mean that as a compliment that it looks like it looks like it costs more than I'm sure it does actually cost, right? Like, uh, based on what I know about funding for certain projects. Uh, now you mentioned Adam, the parks Canada connection for this upcoming season in the full disclosure, I used to work as a historian at parks Canada. Uh, so I, I know probably a bunch of the people who you've, who you've worked with at parks Canada, but what was that partnership like for you guys? And why was it important to bring in parks Canada and, and to have them be part of this season? That helped us in so many ways. Uh, for one thing, having someone like that show some support for you means that you're able uh, to show other people that an organization like Parks Canada has faith in this project so that we're able to then uh, get more funding beyond that. Uh, but also beyond just sort of the dollars and cents, it also meant uh, getting access to Parks Canada locations all across the country, uh, which was huge. So. Uh, Almost every episode in all the upcoming season has some prominently featured Parks Canada location that uh, we might not have been able to even reach without their help. So one of our episodes of the season is going to be all about uh, the history of the Canadian horse uh, and the wild horses on Sable Island off the coast of Nova Scotia, where uh, they're roaming out there alone in the ocean. And thanks to Parks Canada, we're able to go to a place uh, that we've been dreaming about for years and that is not easy to reach uh, and basically impossible without Parks's, Parks Canada's support. Uh, so it really helped uh, unlock locations and funding, but also sort of knowledge and uh, stories and uh, help you know, look over scripts and uh, help nudge us in certain directions and help us uh, you know, with fact checking and making sure we're telling these stories in the right way and with uh, and with input from people who are on the ground. And that's one of the huge privileges of doing this show is getting to travel across the country, not just see the places, but meet the people too. Uh, Parks Canada and other organizations, all the people who are 
uh, so dedicated to the stories of their particular part of the country and have such a deep wealth of knowledge about its history and these stories. Uh, all of that really, really helps us uh, be able to share those stories uh, on the channel. Uh, and without them, yeah, it would be much weaker, weaker without it. Yeah. And I'll say this about Park Scan and just the, the team of historians they have, because most people assume that like, historians in the federal government work at Heritage, and there are some who do, but the team of historians across the country that are part of Parks Canada are, are extraordinarily talented and very dedicated to uh, sharing the stories of their locations, whatever it is. Uh, you know, I was in the, the central office here in Ottawa, uh, but really, and I think the people there do a very good job too, but it's the ones who work on the ground, uh, the, the field historians across the country, and the respective teams at the sites across the country uh, are really quite remarkable. And I was always so impressed uh, whenever stuff of theirs came across my desk or I was able to read it and, and like the exhibits, the way they, they work with guests. It, it really is a dedicated crew. For as cynical as some people can be, and, and sometimes rightly, about federal institutions, uh, you know, the, the people on the ground for Parks Canada do a very, uh, very good job. And, and Kyle, from your perspective, Adam mentioned some of the sites, the visuals of Parks Canada places. They also have the experience of photographing them, filming them. Uh, so, so what kind of access did you get uh, and how much were they helpful in, in shaping the visual side of this season? I, I mean, they were, they were incredible. I'm just, my mind goes to Grasslands National Park where, you know, if we were to just go there blind based on our research and try to find the spots where there's Triceratops bones sticking out of the ground, it would have been, you know, would have taken us a week to, to, whereas when we went there, I now her name is, escapes me, maybe Adam remembers, but we had a Parks Canada guide who, who basically brought us to every location in grasslands that we needed to go to, to set up our shots efficiently. And, and she also, you know, entertained us with, in, with incredible knowledge along the whole way. It was a, it was an incredible experience and, and it was, you know, they've been, amazing through this whole season uh I'm, you know they there's some places we weren't allowed to drone which you know we totally understood we were um but uh, there are some places that you know they allowed us to drone like grasslands national park and that was another thing is like we were able to drone the martella tower in st john new brunswick and with the parks canada guide it, there to help and uh you know that sort of access wasn't really available to us in the second season, we were allowed to, you know, we, we paid to film on sites and things, but we didn't have that sort of a, a connection. And uh, it's just been great for this season. Yeah, it's great what success brings, right? I mean, like, I, as you said earlier, right, you, you, you prove the concept and now people trust you, right? That's essential to a certain extent. You have built enough trust that you are going to tell these stories, not only in a, in a way that is you know, accurate to the stories themselves, but in a way that's entertaining and, and is respectful too of the stories and their sites. So in building that trust, it becomes easier and easier to get people to agree when you submit a request. I would imagine that that now when you reach out to somebody, the response is a lot different potentially than when it was leading into series one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say so. It's It's been a, it seems like every season is kind of a, we're proving ourselves and trying to prove ourselves every season. And this season is the same thing. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's paid off this, uh, it, this, uh, in the access that we've gotten and the, you know, the stories that we got to help share. It's, it's just been, it's like the fruits of our labors are slowly paying off. Yeah. So, so let's get into some of the seasons we talked, or some of this season, excuse me, we talked about some of the stories that are forthcoming, but, you alluded to it, opening up with a two-part series or a two-part episode, excuse me, on piracy in Canada, not a subject that I am particularly familiar with. So what are we, or what should an audience expect when they come to this, when it drops the first part next week on the 28th of June? And, you know, what, what, let's even just start like timeline, like when we talk about piracy, Canada, you know, People have been on the water in this country for thousands of years, but like, how do we sort of define piracy and, and how, how does this story 
start out uh, when we come to it next week? Well, the very first location is another one of the hardest ones for the season, Eel Oat, which is uh, in the middle of the Bay of Fundy. And it's probably actually even harder than Sable Island to get to because uh, people aren't kidding when they talk about the highest tides in the world. And uh, Eel Oat's, yeah, I think eight kilometers offshore or something like that out in the middle uh, of the bay. And we ended up even stranded on an old lobster boat for hours waiting for the tide to come back in at the end of the night uh, and had a few dicey moments out on the waves uh, where we were a little worried about uh, ending up in the water. Uh, but we went out there because it's one place uh, among many on the East Coast where uh, there are sort of pirate legends and myths, and, and you can still find big holes dug in the beach, even though it's a place you shouldn't be going without permission, uh, where you can see where treasure hunters have been digging uh, for the rumors of these bar this buried gold. Uh, so we sort of use that as our way into the, sort of we try to cover it from so the very first uh, European pirates arriving uh, centuries ago, all the way up to privateers during the War of 1812 and uh, and get sort of the whole scope of that centuries-long story uh, and drive home the fact that you know, piracy is something that's sort of cloaked in myth and legend so often, but that there is this real concrete history of uh, these real people who sailed those waters and are tied up with stories of a lot of the communities in the East Coast uh, that we know today, and even famous traditions like Screeching Inn uh, are connected uh, to these stories. So uh, we're trying to take that same approach that we often do of using sort of individual personal stories and meet some of the pirates themselves uh, to, uh, to tell the story of their uh, their particular era of piracy in Canada, and then show a bit too how it's connected to the history of piracy around the world. Uh, and by the end, which is why it's a our first ever two part episode, is because uh, that is such a huge sweeping story that we weren't able to get it uh, down into one episode uh, because we yeah are trying to give sort of an overview uh, of the whole sweep of it and the scale of it which is something I think before we started looking into it, we didn't realize uh, how big the story was and how deeply tied to a lot of East Coast history it was. Uh, so hopefully we've been able to share some of that, some of that sense of awe that we had in coming to the story uh, in these two episodes. So yeah, we're very excited uh, to finally get to share. <laughs> Yeah, the very classic uh, history story of you're doing research and then, oh my God, it's what what's happened. I have all this information that I didn't expect to have, right? Like the and it's always exciting when that happens. But then you look up at the end of the the research and you're like, how am I supposed to? What, what am I supposed to do with all this? It's twice as much as I thought I was going to get uh, out of this research trip. So, uh, so it makes sense. Yeah, two episodes. Uh, it's great. I mean. I guess how how important is the format in terms of the time because it is a YouTube series. You could have made it forty minutes if you wanted, or fifty. Like, there's really no there's no time limit on it. So so why break it up into two? Uh, it, is it to keep the consistency and make sure that each episode fits within a certain format that the audience knows what to expect when they come to it? Yeah, I think it had a natural a natural sort of halfway point. Uh, that made it uh, sort of tempting to do and that there's sort of a rise and fall uh, to it uh, and that, that, yeah, then helped make it just a little more digestible since it's such a huge sweeping story. Uh, it kind of helped to have that dividing point so that people can sort of take a breath uh, <laughs> uh, sort of at the end of the golden age of piracy when things are about to get a little grimmer and more gruesome uh, and also allows us to have another little post roll or like a post episode uh, bonus story uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So it also allowed us to sort of, uh, yeah, sort of underhandedly cram in one more story than we would have been able to otherwise by sticking it on right at the end before the second part starts up. Yeah, and so you have those. You also have the shorts side of it too. So there's the full length episode. The the channel also has a bunch of shorts 
on there as well, five to eight minutes, give or take, uh, depending on the short. Uh, how do those come together and and how do they supplement the the full episodes? Like, how do you guys conceive of those in terms of the entirety of the project? Um, a lot of them are kind of linked by either a theme or a location to the main episodes, but they come together in the same sort of, uh, as you were talking about uh, when you do research and things just grow and grow and grow, they... They start with a small idea and then we do the research and uh, they just become these, they're some of the most exciting episodes, I think, of this season. Um, and uh, it's, they, yeah, so they're just sort of linked uh, to, to the main episodes, but they're also kind of standalone in a sense. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you're, Adam, do you? I think mostly it's just that there are stories that we can tell with a little less time. And then by labeling is them uh, labeling them as shorts, then they're ones that if you only have a few minutes uh, of free time, uh, you know, those are the ones you'll be able to watch quickly. Uh, and this season, the shorts are going to be appearing on Parks Canada's own web YouTube channel uh, before it appears on our own. So there's a bit more of a dividing line there. Uh, and even some of those end up being longer than we really originally intend because the stories end up being, uh, you know, taking us down those rabbit holes and being much more uh, involved than we expected. Uh, and especially this season, yeah, we're trying to have each one sort of reflect one of the longer episodes in some way. So since we've got one full length episode about the uh, Canadian horse and the horses of Sable Island, uh, we're going to have one little short episode about the Newfoundland dog and the role uh, it played in the early history of the country. And uh, yeah, we've got the story of piracy and the big ships of the East Coast. So we're also going to have a story uh, about Rouge Park uh, and lumberjacks who were bringing down trees on the eastern border of Toronto uh, during the Napoleonic Wars to help uh, the British Royal Navy uh, sort of supply itself with masts uh, and talk about sort of those ships and that little connection. Uh, so we try to have little echoes and just mostly have them be the ones that are just a little quicker to tell than something like attempting to sort of do an overview of the entire history of piracy in the eastern half of the country. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for you guys, how do you consider the audience for Canadian history and, and what have you learned in putting together the the three seasons that you've done about how people consider or think about Canadian history and what draws them into it because I, I don't know how you guys consider or what you consider success or or, or if you have expectations for views and uh, run times all that kind of stuff I, I don't know but I look at this from afar as successful in engaging a, a pretty big audience into Canadian history. So I'm curious how you guys conceive of that audience and what it is that brings people to Canadian history that so many people who create things are missing potentially, uh, particularly I'll say in the academic world uh, where books come out to, to nothing. And, and a lot of, I think really good research doesn't generate public interest, whereas you guys have been able to find something that does generate that public interest. So, so just how do you think of the audience? How do you think of Canadians in a general interest within Canadian history? I think we've learned, I think we started by mostly just trying to follow our own interests, our own passions and tell the stories we were the most excited about. Uh, and once we started doing that and obviously also trying to tell them in an engaging way, in a way that feels relevant to people, we found that there does seem to be a real hunger for these stories. And I think uh, there is a growing interest in Canadian history, uh, especially over the last few years, if people begin to learn things about it they maybe weren't aware of before. Uh, but then also as we cross the country, we find that people are uh, really excited about it and what they already know. People are eager to share their own stories. So I think then they're eager to learn uh, other stories about the part of the country they come from, but then also see how that connects 
to other parts of the country, which is something we try to do too, is use the fact that we're able to go uh, to a variety of locations to tell some stories that have connections all across the country and uh, try to cram in as many locations into one story as we can so that people can see that uh, an event that happened in one place might have really big ramifications for another part of the country and that they're all tied together. And the we sort of lucked into the fact that we didn't get a broadcaster right off the bat. So we started doing it for free on YouTube. And I think we're sort of accidentally able to reach people where they already were. Uh, and people are spending time online. A lot of young people especially are spending a lot of time on YouTube. So being able to tell those stories sort of in that new way and on that new platform and reach people without there being any uh, traditional barrier, you know, not having it on television where you have to know that it's on to tune in uh, or even having it be something uh, that you have to have heard about, you know, by reading an article about uh, a wonderful academic book that, you know, people across the country don't always get exposed to even know that those exist. Uh, and we're lucky that we're sort of just on online. So people are readily sharing it with new people and word spreads sort of organically and through the algorithms uh, and uh, reach people who are already willing and eager and have open ears to be hearing more of these stories, the good and the bad, uh, and reach them in a way that, yeah, as we were saying, wasn't possible even not that long ago. Uh, and that once you do reach them and start telling these stories and show to them how interesting they are, how fascinating and complex and how relevant they are to today and to their own part of the country, I think people are just really, yeah, are receptive to that and ready and willing to listen. Yeah. And uh, as we talked about before we started to record too, th the interest in history based on current events, both domestically and internationally, I think has really increased over the last few years. And, and you guys are well positioned uh, in that regard. And you do a really good job telling these stories. So again, the series is Canadiana debuts uh, season three on June the 28th. That's Tuesday. A uh, second episode coming out July the 26th. Those are the two episodes on piracy. And you can look out for the rest uh, over the weeks and months to follow. So, guys, what is the best way for them to follow along with the show, both YouTube, all your socials? Uh, wh where can people follow along with everything you got going on? Head to just YouTube.com slash Canadiana. And you can just click the subscribe button and you'll get alerted every time a new episode comes out. Uh, and we're on all the various social media channels at This Is Canadiana, uh, where you'll find uh, all our updates. Awesome. And uh, encourage everybody to check it out. Uh, even if you're listening to this before season three starts, go watch season one and two and all the shorts. There's a lot there. Like you don't have to wait until Tuesday for anything. There's stuff there that you can go watch. So I uh, encourage everybody to check it out. So Adam Bunch, Kyle Kuko, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank Thanks you. so much for having us.